Yeah, so I thought I would, um, uh, I didn't know what pedagogical meant, so I, uh, all I know is statistical mechanics, so when you mention the word pedagogical, I, I turn to uh, statistical mechanics. So uh, what I'll talk about is uh, what we can learn from a, a statistical mechanics perspective that hopefully is of interest to this group. Uh, so first place, there are a lot of things that statistical mechanics is good for teaching us. Uh, it will, it's the, the right perspective for trying to understand universal properties of phases and universal means, in large measure, those that follow from symmetries. Uh, but in recent years, there's also been a lot of emphasis on topological features of phases. Uh, there are uh, features, universal features, that are uh, associated with the presence of long-range interactions. That's of particular interest here, where strain interactions are a ubiquitous form of long-range interactions. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk about this, just both because of um, time and, uh, and also in part because of ignorance. Um, and more generally, statistical mechanics is the most efficient way to get an understanding of the asymptotic long wavelength, low energy properties of, of phases of matter. Uh, and in particular of the equilibrium and near equilibrium properties. So again, uh, in recent years, there's been a big explosion of interest in far from equilibrium properties. Uh, that requires new tools. That's part of why it's so interesting. But statistical mechanics isn't, isn't really the right way to look at those things. Um, of course, famously, statistical mechanics is the right way to look at universal critical properties where their universal really has an enormous amount of meaning. That is to say, we can solve absolutely the wrong problem and make quantitative predictions about what you'll see in the laboratory. Um, and more vaguely, there are aspects of the phase diagram of materials that one can hope to, to learn about from uh, statistical mechanics what are allowed sequences of phase transitions, what are the constraints on the nature of the phase transitions that occur, uh, what uh, sorts of intertwined orders appear, especially near, near multi-critical points, uh, possibilities of emergent symmetries. These are all sorts of things that statistical mechanics can handle well. There are a lot of things that statistical mechanics perspective is useless for. Uh, Getting numbers, such as, for instance, transition temperatures, is not something that you can particularly ask of a statistical mechanics approach to something. Sometimes, if you're, you're lucky, you can pre predict some trends, but numbers are very hard. Uh, this word mechanism normally means something that is not part of what we consider in statistical mechanics. Uh, again, there are exceptions to that if you're very near, for instance, a point where a transition temperature goes to zero, then you might be able to identify a unique mechanism that makes it non-zero. But in general, when couplings are strong, there is no statistical mechanics answer to what is the mechanism. And of course, insights into materials by design Microscopic details are hidden in statistical mechanics. That's what makes it so appealing for theorists. We can make concrete statements without knowing anything. But on materials by design, you'd actually have to know something. <coughs> OK, so, so that's, that's the background. And so the strategy that, uh, that, that uh, well, that I prefer many people who do statistical mechanics prefer, is the following, to really stress the fact that we're going to solve simple models. We're, we're throwing out a, an awful lot of physics. We're simplifying the problems enormously relative to what you measure in the laboratory. 
And so the price we should pay is that there should be some rather high standards applied to what we mean by solved. And so I'll talk about solutions of various simple models during this, pro uh, this discussion. Solved will mean different things in different cases. It, because of time, I won't articulate in any great detail what I mean by solving, but please feel free to interrupt me and ask me. I will give you as precise of answers as I can. Uh, but so this solving models means various things. It means numerical approaches. It means finding limits in which you can get a controlled analytic solution of problems. Every once in a while, it means guessing some exact solution and proving that it's right. Um, then, of course, since the model is artificial, one is actually rather uh, obligated to ask questions about the robustness of the results. You want to make sure that the things one is talking about aren't artifacts of some particular fine-tuned feature of a model. Um, and, uh, and then, in comparing with experiment, I think one should be very leery about actually making precise quantitative prediction, uh, comparisons between theory and experiment. You know, this even applies in critical phenomena where it's become very customary to fit experimental data to scaling functions and extract critical exponents. <laughs> We know from numerics that that's very dangerous, that until you're extremely close to criticality and it, looking at very large systems, that you can get beautiful fits with completely wrong exponents, in fact, to systems that don't scale at all. And so, to some extent, this is a place where the statistical mechanics perspective maybe has had too much influence on how we think about uh, uh, experiments. Uh, so, so I'm going to be much vaguer. In fact, I'm not going to mention experiments today. Um, so here are the model problems that I'm going to discuss that I hope will be useful uh, as sort of background information. First, I'll solve the simplest possible model of a pneumatic. Maybe this is a caricature of the insulating ferro-quadrupolar systems that Ian talked about yesterday, uh, in which there's no other order and no other interesting degrees of freedom other than the pneumatic degrees of freedom. Uh, then I will take that problem and couple it to electrons and examine the occurrence of superconductivity near a pneumatic quantum critical point again, in a simple model problem. Uh, I'll talk about uh, this uh, idea uh, that was also touched upon yesterday of some sort of this pneumatic uh, order uh, arising from the uh, antiferromagnetic correlations in a frustrated quantum antiferromagnet. Um, and finally, I'll talk about the role of quench disorder, uh, again, in simple models on this notion of vestigial pneumaticity. Uh, I already said that I already apologize that I'm going to um, uh, uh, omit discussions of long range strain. So, so here's the simplest model you can write down of a pneumatic. Uh, here I have a square lattice. I have some sort of pseudo-spin degree of freedom that in this case lives on the bonds of the lattice and can take two values, either tau z can be plus one or minus one. Here I've labeled tau by which bond it lives on. That's why it's got two subscripts here. And the simplest model I write down is just a classical Ising antiferromagnet so that the ground state of this model would have, for instance, tau z equals plus one on all the x-oriented on all the x-oriented 
bonds, and tau z equals minus 1 on all the y-oriented bonds. So this state preserves translation symmetry, but breaks the fourfold rotation symmetry of the system. So I'm allowed to call that a pneumatic state. And this model has a phase diagram that looks like this. There's a high temperature symmetric phase, a low temperature pneumatic phase. How do I know that? Well, look, if I instead think about this as the square lattice of the bond sites, this is just a somewhat smaller unit cell, but if you sort of twist your head, I've just written down the classical Ising antiferromagnet on the square lattice, and this is one of the classical problems. In fact, in two dimensions, there's even an exact solution of it. So we know everything about the solution of this problem. Um, I can make this problem quantum mechanical, and the simplest way to make it quantum mechanical is to introduce a non-commuting operator here. So I turn on a transverse field. This is the same sort of transverse field in theory talk that Ian was talking about yesterday. And this gives the problem quantum dynamics. And this is just the transverse field Ising antiferromagnet. And so its phase diagram is, again, very well known. There is a pneumatic phase, a symmetric phase. There is a quantum critical point. Everything about this problem is really understood. Um, the fact that I looked at an Ising antiferromagnet was unimportant. I could just as easily have defined my pseudospins to live on the sites. If I did that, these would be more analogous to the quadrupole uh, moments that Ian was talking about directly. So I would consider spin, pseudo spin up to mean the red lobes of the quadrupole are pointing this way and the blue lobes are pointing that way so that the ferromagnetic state of this version of the model would be the pneumatic state. That's just identification. Uh, but this has exactly the same phase diagram. So it's, it's another microscopic uh, realization of exactly the same physics. This is the transverse field Ising ferromagnet. So, okay, so this problem is really solved. We, there's detailed understanding based on numerics, on RG, on series expansion. Uh, 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 in this case, we know the universal properties uh, of the quantum critical point are exactly those of the D plus one dimensional classical Ising model on the same lattice. Um, one important thing to note is that although critical exponents will depend on dimension, this phase diagram is what you'll get in this problem regardless of dimension so long as the dimension is greater than or equal to two. Um, and in particular, if one was thinking of a quasi-2D system, so layered system with weak couplings between the layers, really nothing much about this phase diagram will depend on the strength of the coupling between the layers. Uh, OK, good. So now let's get one step more complicated and ask, let's, what happen, let's ask what happens if we couple this, I, this pneumatic degree of freedom, this Ising pneumatic degree of freedom, to electrons. And so this is the simplest model in which I can do that. Here, this first term, this is just the model I wrote down. For some reason, I changed j to v. I'm not exactly sure why I did that. Uh, Oh, actually, I do know why I did that, because I'm going to show you Monte Carlo results later, and V is the symbol that was used in the Monte Carlo results. So uh, this is exactly the model we had before. This is nearest neighbor pseudospins on the bond lattice interacting with each other. There's some quantum dynamics. Uh, quantum dynamics for these pseudospins. Then there's electrons that live on the direct lattice of the system. 
And then the hopping matrix element of the electron from site I to site J is bigger or smaller depending, hmm, depending upon whether the pseudo spin on that bond is up or down. So that couples the pneumatic degrees of freedom to an electron gas, and now I can solve this problem. So this is an example of a metallic critical system, and this has been a class of problems that have been really much debated and much studied in the theory community for the last uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, there's a lot that's been written about it. I would claim that by now, the solution of this problem is largely understood, and I would very much recommend looking at this lovely review article in Annual Reviews of Condensed Matter Physics by Erisberg, Sam Letterer, Yoni Shatner, and Trepst, what's his first name? Zeman. Zeman. Zeman Trepst, right. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, so, um, oh, alpha is, ref it, it's an analogous in high energy physics to a Yukawa coupling. Uh, I don't know why I mentioned that. So here's, uh, here's an example of a solution of this problem. So what does the solution mean? In this case, this solution is simply a quantum Monte Carlo uh, study of precisely this problem. Uh, it turns out that we can go to large enough systems that the answers are independent of system size. So I think I can be confident in telling you that this is the solution. And what's being shown here is temperature, and here is this transverse field. The other parameters here are being held fixed. And the things you should notice is there's a pneumatic transition that's coming to zero toward a quantum critical point. There's another line here, which is a crossover line defined in a way that I won't bother to tell you, but it's defined in some way. And there is a critical regime here in a critical fan about a quantum critical point below. And there's then a superconducting transition that occurs below this line here. Steve? Yeah. If I were to switch off H, the yes. system still has quantum dynamics to the couples to the uh, electrons. No, the, the tau z is conserved. Okay. So you must have it. Yeah, yeah. So this, this problem has no quant, the, the taus have no quantum dynamics without H. Um, okay, so, so here's what you learn from this. First place, there is a pneumatic quantum critical point. I was convinced when we launched on this study that by Murphy's law, uh, the transition would become first order or something nasty like that. There still is a quantum critical point. Uh, there is a superconducting dome. Now, by dome, you notice that, yes, the TC is more or less maximum where the, uh, where the uh, quantum critical point is. But this dome is not particularly sharply constrained there. We're getting superconductivity from pneumatic fluctuations out here, even when we're very far away from the quantum critical point. Now, I know for sure that superconductivity here is being caused by pneumatic fluctuations because there's nothing else in my model. But what you can see is because even when it's only pneumatic fluctuations causing TC that the TC dome is not very peaked, that in some more complicated model where there are other things contributing to superconductivity, it's actually going to be very hard to make a concrete statement about what the mechanism is at all, even if I do have a pneumatic fluctuation and a pneumatic quantum critical point. Um, there is a quantum critical regime. I, I didn't define it for you, but believe me, there's all sorts of weird things that happen in this regime. However, it's not controlled by asymptotic universal critical exponents. In fact, 
for instance, the pneumatic susceptibility to very good approximation fits a simple Curie-Weiss law. And since this is a two-dimensional problem with no long-range forces, this is one thing that everybody would say shouldn't happen. Okay? But it does. And the other thing is there's no, there's no metallic pneumatic quantum critical point. The high TC here, which in some ways is very exciting, is also uh, the statement that metallic behavior is destroyed on a scale that's relatively high. It's why we don't see any universal scaling properties, because before we start seeing universal scaling properties characteristic of a metallic quantum critical point, the thing becomes superconducting. Deep in the superconducting state, there will be some asymptotic critical behavior, but it will be, be that of my pure pneumatic. The superconductivity will have gapped out all the electronic degrees of freedom, and so we'll be back to d plus one-dimensional classical behavior in asymptopia. Okay. So um, that's my first two topics. Um, third topic is this notion of a uh, vestigial pneumatic order associated with a uh, frustrated quantum antiferromagnet. Um, I did want to make one referencing comment here. This idea of uh, order that is some uh, results from partial melting of some primary order is actually much older. It's older than the iron uh, superconductors. Uh, this particular version in which uh, a stripe fluctuations of a stripe ordered state gives rise to a pneumatic phase uh, was contained in this paper by Premi Chandra, Piers Coleman, and Tolia Larkin from 1990. Um, however, even earlier, there were ideas of uh, hexatic phases, for instance, associated with partial melting of charge density wave phases or crystalline phases. So this is an idea with a long history. Uh, I can't fail to mention that there is actually a rigorous proof that's because first place I've been involved in very little that can be called rigorous. Second place, I really like the title of the paper. Um, uh, okay, so with that, I'm going to uh, uh, not be historical. I'm going to, uh, to present a pass through this phase diagram that comes from this set of papers and actually some work I'm carrying out now in collaboration with a student, UA, U, or U, UA, I'm not sure which. Um, okay, so, um, so back to this problem. Now, now we're going to have the same lattice, but now we're going to have spins on the lattice sites, and we're going to have antiferromagnetic exchange interactions between nearest neighbor spins, J1, between second neighbor spins, J2, and a biquadratic coupling, K. Um, this problem can be solved, the ground state of this problem can be solved uh, for the classical system, which is to say when the spin of these, the spin S is infinity, and it has a rather ornate phase diagram like this. It has a Niel state when J1 is dominate, it has a stripe phase when J2 is dominant and K is positive. It has this beautiful vortex lattice phase, which, uh, which we also heard about yesterday, when uh, K is negative and J2 is, nom is, posit is, po is dominant. There's a non-coplanar conical vortex lattice phase, uh, which I couldn't even draw. And there's a helical phase. Um, so it's got a fairly ornate phase diagram, even for the classical ground state. And then one can ask, how is this phase diagram modified 
by the first quantum corrections. So one can study this problem when the spin is large but finite. And well, for the most part, if the spin is large, it, the ground state looks more or less like it does if the spin is infinite. But there are a few changes. This stripe phase is stable down to slightly negative k. Uh, that, that actually is what people call order by disorder. Plotted this way, it's not very spectacular. But then there's a complicated region here where all the phase diagrams meet, where the large S expansion simply breaks down. And in fact, in this whole range here, which was previously occupied by the conical phase, the uh, first quantum corrections diverge. So presumably that means there's some sort of quantum disordered phase here, but determining it from the large S expansion is difficult. In fact, there have been a lot of numerical studies of problems in this regime. Uh, those tend to work with small s, s equals a half or s equals one. And in that regime, people have found evidence for quantum spin liquids, valence bond solids, and quantum pneumatics. This piece of the problem is really not solved yet. So I'm not going to tell you the answers to it because I'm going to try to be disciplined and tell you things that I know are true. Um, but the finite temperature phase diagram in multiple places of this phase diagram are uh, simple to construct and uh, perhaps relevant to this crowd. So, uh, uh, because there are special features of two dimensions, I'm going to modify the model that we're studying by uh, introducing three-dimensional effects. So here's the three-dimensional version of the same model. Here n should be viewed as labeling a plane. And so this part here is the same model I've already written down, just within each plane. And then here, I've turned on a nearest neighbor antiferromagnetic coupling between spins in neighboring planes. And I'm going to imagine Jz is small, thinking of a layered system, but not zero. And in order to solve this problem, I need to invent a parameter. So instead of large S here, for that which doesn't help in finite temperature, we treat these spins instead of being Heisenberg spins, which have three components. We treat them as having some large number of components n and solve the problem systematically in powers of 1 over n and then report results for n equals 3. These large n expansions are known to be moderately reliable. And so here's a phase diagram that you get. So <coughs> So what's going on here? Here's temperature, and here's Jz. Uh, you should notice that there's uh, 10 to the minus 3 here. These are all really small values of Jz. So 1 here means that Jz is 1,000 times smaller than the in-plane J. So I'm looking at very highly layered problems, and you notice that nonetheless, the phase diagram here, unlike the previous one, depends very strongly on this three-dimensional coupling. So what are these? This here is the pneumatic transition temperature. So below this temperature, the system breaks C4 symmetry. This is the spin density wave ordering temperature. And the reason this is so singular is due to the Merman-Wagner theorem. As Jz goes to zero, this transition temperature must go to zero. So the good news is that there really is this vestigial pneumatic phase here. It occurs in a parametrically broad range of temperatures if Jz is small enough, because the pneumatic transition, being an Ising transition, has a finite temperature transition in two dimensions, whereas the spin ordering transition, being a Heisenberg transition, has zero transition temperature in two dimensions. So that's the good news. 
The bad news is that this line, this spin density wave line, really comes screaming up awfully fast. And by the time the system is a tenth of a percent anisotropic, this phase has almost disappeared. So this physics of this vestigial pneumatic phase, which I think we all love, is actually much more delicate than we would like to believe. Um, okay, I'm going to cover one more topic. I may actually finish on time. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, to look at the effect of disorder on this problem. And um, because I want disorder to couple in what's called a random field sense, I'm actually going to switch models a little bit. I'm going to abandon my spin model. The model I'm going to write down is still going to look an awful lot like the spin models, but I'm going to use different terms, and, and I will, at the end, tell you why it was so important that I change terms. So now what I'm going to look at is a incommensurate charge density wave. So I have a charge density wave in some tetragonal system which can oscillate with uh, ordering wave vector qx, some wave vector in the x direction, or qy, some, uh, some ordering vector that's rotated by 90 degrees relative to this. And there, I'm imagining a symmetry between those. And um, uh, in fact, there are several symmetries here. There's a symmetry under exchanging x and y, that's C4 rotation symmetry. There's a symmetry under multiplying psi x by a phase, that's translating the system in the x direction. There's multiplying uh, psi y by a phase, that corresponds to translating the system in the y direction. All of those are symmetries of the problem. Uh, the Symmetric phase will have the expectation value of all these psi's equal to zero. The charge density wave phases are two possible ones. There's a stripe ordered phase in which one of these has a non-zero expectation value and the other one has a zero expectation value. For instance, we would have a unidirectional charge density wave in the x direction, which is spontaneously chosen. It could have been in the y direction. So in such a phase, for instance, the expectation value of psi x will be non-zero, the expectation value of psi y will be zero, or vice versa. One other thing to note is that if I look at the expectation value of psi x squared, this is a quantity that's translationally invariant because I've taken the absolute value squared, so this is invariant under translations. Psi x squared minus psi y squared is non-zero. If I'm in the stripe-ordered phase in the x direction, then this quantity is positive. If I'm in the stripe-ordered phase in the y direction, this quantity is negative. I could have a checkerboard-ordered phase in which both of these condense with equal magnitude. So psi x is equal to psi y and both are equal to zero and in which this quantity, which measures the breaking of C4 symmetry, would be zero. And then I could imagine a pneumatic phase. So what would a pneumatic phase be? A pneumatic phase is translationally invariant, so it means that both of these have, non -zero, have zero expectation value, but we're still, this quantity is non-zero. It means that fluctuations of the charge density wave order in the x direction say, are stronger than fluctuations of the charge density wave order in the y direction. So this is an example of what's called a composite order parameter. It's a case where the primary fields in the system have zero expectation value, but some non-trivial composite order parameter develops an expectation. Uh, okay, so here's the model I'm going to look at. Um, well, you know, it's some um, traditional Landau, Ginsburg, Wilson, uh, Hamiltonian. It's got some stiffness terms 
for the charge density waves. It's got some mass, so this thing traditionally will be negative when the temperature is above Tc, the mean field Tc, and positive when this is below the mean field Tc. There are some, bi there are some quartic interactions. There are two things that I want to, uh, uh, whoops, there are two things that I want to bring to your attention. So one is this coupling constant gamma. So gamma is the biquadratic coupling between the charge density wave in the x direction and the charge density wave in the y direction. When gamma is positive, you favor stripes. It means that if you have a charge density wave in the x direction, you don't want to have one in the y direction. If gamma is negative, it favors checkerboards. It says if you have a charge density wave in the x direction, that encourages you to also have one in the y direction. And uh, I'm also thinking of this as being a layered system, so J labels layers, and J perpendicular is the weak coupling between layers. So the problem we were looking at before is sort of like this problem with gamma positive and J perpendicular very small. Um, to solve this problem, so these things are complex fields, which means they have two components, a real and imaginary part. That's n equals 2 in this case. I can imagine generalizing these to be n component fields and solving this problem in the n goes to infinity limit. And that gives you an example of what I meant by the large n method. Um, there's also uh, the Feynman uh, variational mean field approach or self-consistent phonon approach to the problem. So if you like to be formal, you can say I'm solving it in the large n limit. And if you like mean field theory, you can say I'm using a self-consistent phonon mean field theory to solve this problem. All right, and here's the phase diagram that we get. Uh, this is more or less like the phase diagram I showed you before. This is down here is the three-dimensional coupling. Up here is the temperature. Uh, you may notice that there is a very narrow vestigial pneumatic phase. The only reason you see it is because we've cheated. It's actually much narrower than that. Uh, and that goes away at some critical value of the interplane coupling. How did you cheat? What? How did you cheat? We, uh, we multiplied it by 10. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I mean, it's, it's in the figure caption, but uh, you know, the figure just looked dumb otherwise. <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't fit the word pneumatic in. <laughs> um, OK, now, so now I want to use this problem to investigate what happens when we include disorder in the problem. So um, random uh, field problem is what's, that's a, a technical term in statistical mechanics, the random field problem. The random field problem is the problem that's relevant to any problem in which the disorder couples directly to the order parameter. And so it's for sure relevant to any problem in which the broken symmetries involved are pure spatial symmetries. For the spin density wave where the spin involves time reversal symmetry, uh, the coupling to disorder is a little bit more subtle. And so I don't want to get into that problem. That's why I transferred to the charge density wave version of the same problem. OK, so, so here's, unfortunately, here I use the symbol S. S here doesn't mean spin. S is a generalized. Uh, 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 representation of an order parameter. So this is a random field in which there's a field on each site J that favors some particular orientation of the order parameter. And maybe I'll assume that it's uh, random, Gaussianly random distributed or something like that. Now, there are theorems about the random field problem that determine almost everything I'm going to tell you. The first theorem is that 
D equals two is the lower critical dimension for the Ising model. That means that there can be no ordered state, no broken symmetry in dimension two or less. And D equals four is the lower critical dimension for all continuous symmetries, including the Heisenberg symmetry and so on. Um, there's a subtlety for the XY model that I don't want to get into, but in interest of truth in advertising, I will mention that there is a subtlety here of the XY model in three dimensions. All right, so here's, here's our phase diagram. Here's the phase diagram that we were looking at. So now what I'm going to do is sit at some fixed value of the inter interplane coupling where I have, say, a stripe gra ground state, maybe a pneumatic phase in a narrow window, and then a homogeneous isotropic phase at high temperature. And now what I'm going to ask is, what happens if I turn on quench disorder on this problem? How does the phase diagram change? And so, since the stripe order is a continuous symmetry breaking, and since I'm in dimensions less than or equal to four, I know I'm not going to have a stripe phase at all once I turn on any disorder. And on the other hand, because I'm in dimensions bigger than two, I know if the disorder is weak enough, I will still have pneumatic order because it's an Ising order. So this is what the phase diagram comes out. I mean, that's a calculation. We did this large N calculation, but I knew everything about how it was coming out on the basis of theorems. And so now the good news is that once I've taken into account the effects of disorder, rather than this vestigial pneumatic phase being too small to see without cheating, it becomes the whole phase diagram. Uh, this is sort of an experiment. Um, well, it is an experiment. It's STM on bismuth 2201. This is some rather big field of view. This is something called a Z-map. Uh, Z-map, okay, I can tell you what a Z-map is if you care. But um, it's a Z-map which you then Fourier transform, Fourier filter to break it up into place pieces that have Fourier components near some QX, though, and then Fourier transform those back, or near QY and Fourier transform those back. The pattern, which you can hardly see, is the result of that double Fourier filtering, but the interesting thing is the red regions are the regions where there's stronger Fourier components near 3 or 4th zero, and the blue regions are regions where there's stronger Fourier components near 0, 3 quarters. So this is a picture of what that random field problem is telling us. Here we clearly don't have long-range charge density wave order, but we do have rather extended patches. Uh, I think that if you look at this, you could more or less convince yourself that the red regions barely percolate. So this is a system in which there is some weak vestigial pneumatic order in the sense that in each region, you pin something that either looks like one value or the other, but there's a global broken symmetry in which one direction over the other is favored. This is, they've seen this for several different dopings, but I believe this one is at optimal doping. And, you know, one of the things is that this is several year old data, but it hasn't yet been published, and I don't know why. So if any of you see any of these people and think this is interesting, I mean, among other things, I mean, it's interesting. It's also really, really pretty, I think. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to end with it.